Okay, Mark, thank you very much. So uh, it is my pleasure to chair this uh, seminar. It will be given by Professor Gabriel Epley. And maybe let me start by introducing or, um, to the speaker. Gabriel Epley is a professor of physics at ETH Zurich and EPF Lausanne and head of the photon science division of the Paul Scherer Institute. He obtained his uh, different degrees from MIT. And it is interesting to know that Gabriel has spent some of his career time in industry. First, as a work study student at IBM, and after his PhD, moving to Bell Laboratories, and then to NEC in New York, Princeton, I think, working on problems ranging from liquid crystals to magnetic data storage. He then was a co-founder and director of the London Center for Nanotechnology and a Queen professor at University College London. On the research side, Gabriel is famous for his work on high-TC superconductors and quantum phase transitions, among others. Today, his research focuses on the applications of nanotechnology and photon science to biomedicine and quantum information processing. Uh, for his work, he received numerous awards, including the Mott Prize of the Institute of Physics in London, the Oliver Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society, the Nail Medal, International Magnetist Prize of the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics, is also a member of the US National Academy of Science. With this, uh, it is probably not necessary to tell you all that. You should ask all of your questions using the chat, and I'll give you the word at the end of the seminar. With this, Gabriel, uh, the floor is yours, and you will tell us about uh, interface physics and COVID-19. Gabriel, please. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for the kind introduction, it's uh, of course it'd be nicer to be in the Alps, but I, I uh, originally, of course, had this been in the Alps, I would have talked about something perhaps uh, much closer to what everybody else was talking about uh, at the meeting. Uh, but uh, I, I decided that maybe uh, because I only have one lecture to give, and uh, we haven't uh, really. Uh, mentioned at all that that you know physicists can actually contribute uh, you know not just to understanding uh, interfaces in conventional solids if there are also interfaces actually that are involved in actually COVID nineteen and and there are things that physicists can actually do uh, to to maybe contribute perhaps not to COVID nineteen but maybe to COVID twenty one or twenty two. Uh, so uh, let me just start by uh, introducing the, the collaborators, the team. Uh, the team actually consists of uh, various uh, experimentalists. I've listed here uh, John Hales, Guy McMahon, Paul Dalby, and, and John Ward. Uh, Guy is actually at, at uh, PSI now, the, the rest are at uh, UCL. And then I'll talk at the beginning a little bit about work that we just recently published uh, uh, mainly actually I'm going to show it for pedagogical purposes concerning the epidemiology uh, and the control of the of the disease as well as its impact on the uh, economy. Uh, so these are the references. Uh, the things that are the, the things that I'll talk about are actually uh, published uh, very recently. Uh, you might also want to visit this uh, uh, covidsim.org site to, to, to play policymaker uh, in the, uh, in, for, for the pandemic. Okay, so the outline of the talk is following. Uh, Jean-Marc, just let me know, if, did, I have an hour and a half, is that correct? Uh, okay, Mark, uh, if it's a seminar, it would be one hour and 15 okay. minutes for the okay, talk fine. and 25 minutes for uh, questions. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I think I can it's stick with yeah, so, so I'm just going to give you some, some general background because I, I wasn't quite sure whether it's a seminar or a lecture, but I think it's important just to remind you sort of the basic uh, uh, math of the control of the pandemic and then the importance, in fact, of, of biophysical testing. Uh, I'll just uh, give you a, a brief introduction to how uh, people actually detect the virus, count the virus, uh, and that entails also the really important concept of chemical amplification, 
Uh, I'll then talk about uh, tests for proteins and their interactions with small molecules. Uh, this is uh, very important, of course, uh, for testing either uh, uh, for viral coats, which might be a faster test than the conventional PCR test I'll talk about. Uh, of course, it's, it's important also in establishing uh, the level of immunity that people have by counting the antibodies that, uh, that accumulate uh, uh, as, as the, uh, the uh, immune system kicks in. Uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll contrast and show how actually optical amplification uh, might actually uh, play a role for proteins that's similar to uh, the uh, role that the chemical amplification of PCR plays for uh, nucleic acids. Uh, and then I'll give specific examples in, in how essentially we can use a concept from physics, laser, for measuring viral load, which is you know, how many viruses you have uh, you know, per cubic centimeter of fuel fluid. And then I'll talk about how viral lasers actually can be used as antibody assays. So this, is, this gives you a, a roadmap. Uh, so let me uh, start off by uh, repeating what you probably know uh, any educated person should know from reading the newspapers or reliable newspapers. Uh, the, the fact is that without a fully vaccinated population uh, to really control the pandemic, we need to implement social distancing, which includes, of course, mask discipline in tandem uh, with testing for the virus and antibodies. So the basic, of course, uh, number that characterizes uh, the, any pandemic is, is the so-called reproduction number. It basically, it, it, it tells you essentially how many people, uh, while they're uh, symptomatic, uh, actually, uh, or while, they, while they're basically, uh, uh, while that virus is active in their bodies, how many other people they can infect. And uh, this defines this number R, the reproduction number. So it's the number of new infections induced by an infected person, uh, unmitigated, uh, and this we have you know, fairly, uh, you know, fairly good statistics by now because we've repeated the experiments uh, many times in essentially all countries of the world. Uh, the uh, coronavirus has a reproduction number of something like three. A SARS virus uh, had, had a, actually a substantially lower uh, reproduction number, but it was uh, substantially uh, more lethal. Okay, but in any case, uh, if you know anything about mathematics, of course, if 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 uh, you will, if you have any reproduction number which is greater than one, of course, you'll have an exponentially growing wave. And now uh, the question uh, is, of course, how do you uh, reduce this reproduction number uh, to one? And and. And of course, at R equals one, you essentially have a stable situation. Uh, you have essentially the same number, uh, assuming, of course, that the virus is active only for some number of days, a finite time. You have equilibrium. You have the same number of people flowing in with the virus, uh, getting infected as the people are essentially overcoming their infection. So R equals one is, is, is sort of the uh, maximal value that you would like to have. Uh, for R. So how do you reduce R from something like three to, to one or below? Well, these are these measures I mentioned a minute ago. It's uh, physical distancing, again, including masking. Uh, and then there's a second thing, which is, uh, which basically most uh, uh, countries have done is the so-called uh, contact tracing. When people are symptomatic, the idea here is that you, you actually uh, test them, of course, for uh, the, uh, the disease for the virus, uh, but then you try to understand whom they've been in contact with for the last uh, week or so and test all of those people as well. And, and of course, then you know roughly where you're at uh, and you know how many people you need to quarantine because of course people, uh, people who test positive, then you essentially tell them uh, to stay home and not have any contact with, uh, with other people. Uh, and of course, the other thing you do is, is, is so the contact tracing is a very, very important, uh, very important uh, aspect where, where whenever there is a case, you try to go after it, you pursue it, you put people into quarantine, uh, 
Of course, you also then have a measurement, which is important for any sort of feedback loop. Uh, then physical distancing, as I said before, there's school and shop closures as well as imposing distancing requirements. Okay, so that's that's basically what we've been doing. Uh, you hear me now? Is my, my screen has just gone dead. Hello? Yes, Gabriel, everything is fine. Uh, not at my end. Uh, my screen has just died. Let me just see if I can... Uh, 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 this is extremely disturbing. Um, do you see it still, the screen again? Uh, I do see your screen. I do not see the participants for some reason, but... Uh... Yeah, okay, let me just uh, see if I can do full screen. Okay, so here we are. So, you, you see the full screen. Uh, no, uh, I see the full screen, but I see one slide. I see your next slide. I see the LAPS. Oh, okay, so this is interesting. So somehow, yeah, it's not compatible with the Apple uh, screen. Uh, let me just see. Let me just try to, uh, I'm sorry how, why this went uh, wrong. Really, uh, you still are... Let me just get this right here. Okay, you see the full screen now? Okay, now it's fine, yes. Sorry, it basically just uh, died somehow. Okay, uh, so uh, I've, in the previous slide, I just gave sort of a, a journalistic type description of what we're doing now. Uh, this shows you classic engineering description. What we have is a feedback and control loop here. And so this feedback and control loop uh, really allows you sort of to start doing some mathematics or, or if you like statistical mechanics, you have a system connected to a bath. These are the external sources of infections, which you see at the top uh, left-hand corner. And, and of course, these, these external sources of infections are very, uh, you know, interesting right now in, in Europe. Uh, for example, uh, we're, we're basically told that uh, we shouldn't be traveling to the U.S., nor should people from the U.S. be traveling here. That's one reason why the Zoosh got canceled. So that bath is a problem for, for uh, both at the macro level for everybody, but it's also been a particular problem for the Lazouche lectures this summer. Uh, so that's the bath that you're connected to. And then, and then there's, there's a, a, of course, this big red box, which is, of course, testing which gives you the outcomes that you're interested in. So testing, of course, what you really want to know is the prevalence of the disease. So, uh, and you'd like to know the, the, and then by taking the derivative of the prevalence of the disease with respect to time, you can deduce, of course, the, the reproduction factor. So uh, you have essentially the output, which is the red thing, and these external sources of infections, which is the general path in which you're, 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 you're operating. And, and then what you do is, of course, you, 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 you have these external sources. You also have the testing. Testing gives you the growth rate. And between those uh, knowledge of the external sources and the testing, you then control uh, the society. You control, uh, it's, uh, you control uh, people's uh, uh, social distancing. And you open and close, or let's say uh, you buy by telling them to wear a mask in public transportation or opening and closing shops. And so you keep going around this loop. And so you have a classic feedback and control situation, uh, which actually uh, in the first phase of the epidemic uh, in Europe and also uh, to an even greater degree in, in, in East Asia was very, very successful. So uh, this shows the progression of the disease. It just, uh, sorry about the German, this just happens to be uh, what we did in Switzerland. Uh, at, the, at the top, you're just seeing uh, the prevalence, basically the, the number of, uh, as measured essentially by observations, uh, basically test positive tests of symptomatic people and their contacts as a function of time. You see this classic uh, wave where initially you have an exponential growth basically at the, at the left-hand side. Uh, you see the reproduction number, by the way, in, uh, in, the, in the lower frame of this slide. 
you see the reproduction number here in Switzerland wasn't quite up to three. It started up maybe around around two, and then as as the uh, as as the social measures kicked in, uh, they managed essentially to reduce this reproduction rate uh, to go below uh, to below one. Uh, basically, in the April, basically the March to mid mid April time frame, and then uh, by the by the early summer, uh, we had actually gotten the uh, reproduction rate to, to to well below one simply by implementing measures. Now, of course, you know what happened at the same time, as uh, as we reproduced as we reduced the reproduction rate, as the economy, of course, uh, was severely damaged. And so there was, uh, you know, at some at some stage, uh, you know, you're, you know, there are then questions being raised about, you know, how many people are going to die uh, because of uh, you know, the economic uh, an economic depression compared to the lives you're saving by driving, let's say, the reproduction rate all the way down to zero. Okay, so so that's essentially then. Uh, what we have here is 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 not a feedback and control loop. This is just simply a control loop. One single control step, and that's it. And so, uh, uh, just just to tell you, so you, you, you uh, re uh, reproduction rate that is so far below one that essentially nobody can eat anymore because uh, you have an economic depression uh, is, uh, of course, uh, something uh, you also uh, you also want to avoid. And and so, the controlling you really want to control R, and the optimal value is is probably not zero, it's probably ideally maybe somewhat less than uh, somewhat less than than one, or perhaps closer to one than in fact it would be to, to zero. And this just shows you some numbers for Switzerland about what a week of lockdown actually costs, three billion, uh, three billion uh, francs or dollars uh, dollars a week. So there's actually health damage which comes there, uh, and perhaps even even lost lives from the economic cost. On the other hand. Uh, you, you, you certainly don't want to be uh, uh, rising above uh, above one uh, either. Uh, okay, so uh, the other thing is, of course, that if you do release uh, uh, yourselves from uh, lockdown, uh, if you do it too late, you have catastrophic health consequences. Uh, and so this just shows, for example, you know, one headline from the New York Times. The, the, the US, uh, for example, uh, by locking down late in order essentially to save what they thought were bigger amounts uh, in economic activity, uh, lost 36,000 lives. And then of course, if you, if you say each life, just to, to pretend to be an economist, each life is worth, let's say uh, $1 billion, $1 million, you know, you're, you're losing a huge amount of activity, economic activity as well. Okay, so this is the compromise that you want to do. So really, uh, what you want to do is, is you want to essentially manage the pandemic in a feedback and control loop uh, in such a way so that essentially the reproduction rate, which is proportional here to, to, to IC, is, well, that's essentially the refraction of infection, infected people. The critical uh, value here is essentially determined by emergency room capacity, hospitals, you'd really want to stay well below that critical value. And you want to do uh, some kind of testing uh, which damps out these oscillations. Okay, so as you probably know, if you, yeah, if you let's say, have a lockdown, it's successful, you go through that first peak, and then, and then after a while, you, you, know, you, you hit this, uh, uh, you, you hit this point, which is marked by the first vertical dashed line, and you decide, well, maybe now it's time to, uh, to, to uh, release the uh, social distancing measures. And then, of course, there's various, then, of course, immediately uh, you get uh, uh, a second wave of infections. And then uh, you, you can keep, uh, uh, and then, and then you, you, but you need to know that immediately. So you have to keep testing and you have to keep testing promptly so that you never rise above this, uh, this uh, critical value, critical fraction of infected people that you've decided on a political basis and an economic basis is, is, is permissible in your society. And so you want to be testing frequently, often, reliably, so that you're in the situation uh, where, you, where you have relatively 
uh, overdamped or, or highly damped os uh, small oscillations rather than large underdamped oscillations such as those that you see uh, depicted by the blue line. Okay, so that's what you're trying to avoid, the blue line. And uh, the best case scenario until everybody is vaccinated is some minor oscillations of the kind uh, that are indicated by the red curve uh, on this slide. Okay, so, so that's basically uh, why you want to be testing all the time. And, and why you want, of course, uh, to, to, to be able to control uh, reliably, uh, you, you really need to have uh, inexpensive and, and very uh, uh, fast. Of course, the faster you test, anybody who's ever used a temperature, temperature controller in the lab, it's of course always better to sample the temperature often rather than seldomly if you want to avoid large oscillations. Okay, so the same thing applies here. You want reliable tests, just as when you have a temperature controller in the lab, you want to have reliable measurements and frequent measurements of the actual system temperature. Now, uh, I've been mainly focusing on uh, tests of the virus, basically viral counts. And of course, as, uh, of course, as time goes on, uh, there are two things that happen. Uh, one thing is, is there's uh, some type of herd immunity which appears because many people uh, uh, have been exposed to the virus and of course those that survive and in other words those that don't die have some level of immunity although although uh, this is not a talk about immunology I should mention that that it's not clear how long you have immunity uh, and in fact if you can be reinfected but in any case you have some kind of immunity uh, if you have a vaccine, you also have some kind of immunity, and that immunity is expressed essentially by, uh, by a, in quantitative terms, uh, by antibodies. I'm sorry again for the German slide here. Antikörper means, means antibodies. So if you look at the progression of the disease, which is shown uh, on the main part of this slide, you start off with uh, you know, a few little viruses that get in on day zero. There's then some incubation time. And there's some symptoms. If you do random testing, of course, you catch the virus. You could catch the virus immediately in certain individuals and at least get an impression of the aggregate uh, uh, infection rate in the population. Uh, if you have sym if symptomatic, then you test after six days. Uh, you're infectious then for a while. Uh, uh, and then, uh, after, uh, then uh, during that time, of course, the tests also work, the standard PCR tests. A while later, you develop antibodies and then those last for some unknown time. But it's extremely important then not just to count the, uh, the viral load, but also the antibodies, especially uh, to, to, to figure out whether you may have immunity in the future. And also once you're taking vaccines, whether you acquired immunity through the vaccine. So there are two types of tests that we need to focus on. There's essentially viral code counts, loads and antibody loads. Okay, so we're actually here now faced with a physics problem. So I promised you we would get to physics eventually. Uh, and this is uh, uh, what we want to do. We want to count big molecules, which are the antibodies, which are these little Y-shaped things like right here. And you want to count viruses, which is this big object, which you've seen uh, many times uh, on the news. Okay, so let me just give you a, a, a primer, a very, very quick uh, a reminder of sort of a, a newspaper level a reminder of what's at stake here. What is a virus? The virus is, is, is this, this uh, package. It's actually, in this case, the, it's interesting. The uh, coronavirus is a very large virus. It's 10 nanometers in diameter, 100 nanometers. So it's actually a, a mesoscopic object uh, to physicists. Uh, it's quite a pretty object. It's sort of the self-assembled thing. Uh, what it consists of is, is a core, uh, which is, which is a genetic material. Uh, this is basically nucleic acids, uh, which are coded by a nucleoprotein. That's this blue squiggly line uh, in this uh, view graph. And then it's surrounded by this coat, uh, which, which includes these famous spikes, which dock onto 
your uh, pulmonary cells and essentially cause uh, havoc that way. Uh, and those are all those are all made out of proteins. And so uh, everything here uh, is is essentially all of the content of the biological content of the rest of the talk is is, is encapsulated encapsulated here. Uh, what you really want to detect now is the virus itself. And uh, it'll turn out that the most reliable way to fingerprint the virus is actually simply to look at the uh, nucleic, uh, at the genetic material inside. You basically, uh, you have all of this RNA inside, uh, and then you can essentially match that to the known sequence for the uh, known amino acid sequence for the, for the RNA. And then say you 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 have the disease or don't. I'll get into more detail in a moment. And the other things, of course, that you want to do is you want to look at uh, maybe the coat proteins, and you, of course you want to look at the, the the antibodies that go and disable the virus, maybe maybe destroy it somehow, uh, which dock basically the antibodies or, or generically dock onto the surface of the virus or interfere with its replication uh, once it's invaded your body. Okay. Gabriel? Yes? Uh, can you use your mouse to show us what you're uh, pointing? Yeah. Okay, so this is the, yeah, I'm sorry. This is the genetic, can you see the mouse? Okay, thank you. Sorry, so this is the genetic material. So this is the nucleoprotein, which codes essentially the RNA, the rabionucleic acid. And then here, these are the code, this is all proteins around it, okay? Is that... Clear? So these are the envelope proteins. And then here you have, of course, these famous uh, spikes, uh, which, which uh, basically dock onto your uh, cells' bodies, into the cells in your body, uh, which then, then essentially uh, allow, essentially, the, uh, the, the virus uh, to hijack your, your body cells, essentially, to reproduce uh, itself. Okay. okay, so very, very quick. Uh, remind you about these two types of biochemical entities that we're now interested in detecting. Okay, I said that to fingerprint the virus, uh, the gold standard is so-called uh, PCR test. That's what everybody essentially uh, uh, is talking about. Uh, you, you essentially there, you look, you, you, you get access to the genetic material. Genetic material cons consists of in this case, in the virus case, consists of RNA, um, and uh, RNA, of course, you can you can convert into into DNA, double helix, RNA, single helix. Uh, these nucleic acids are remarkably simple. There's only essentially uh, four of them. Uh, actually, there's 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 one. There's cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil. Basically, for in the case of the RNA, there's four of them. Uh, where uh, the first three are the same as for RNA, uh, but the timing is different for, for, for DNA. And then these uh, acids, these, this genetic code, which is just four digits, of course has these marvelous reproduction mechanisms, uh, which have to do with the complementarity of these, of these, uh, uh, of these nucleic acids uh, uh, when they're assembled into DNA. So, so for example, uh, in the case of DNA, so the timing, okay, is complementary, uh, uh, can be complementary, uh, this base pair here uh, with, the, uh, 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 with the adenine, uh, and the cytosine is complementary with the guanine. And so this genetic code here is, is, is then used in the ribosome essentially to produce proteins, which I'll get to in a minute. But the simplicity of DNA and DNA chem biochemistry essentially makes it uh, actually uh, very, uh, enables some very, very powerful tests. And in particular, what it allows you to do uh, is actually to chemically amplify the genetic material so that you can see it easily by in an optical assay. So how does a gold standard PCR test for the virus work? So typically, uh, you go to a testing site, and, and either they, they take your blood or essentially they uh, obtain a, a specimen by, uh, with a swab in your nose. Uh, that swab is then uh, essentially uh, put into a, a solvent, 
uh, where you said you, you then, uh, which you then cook in various ways to essentially lyse the virus. That means you take the virus apart. You then extract essentially from that uh, sample uh, the RNA strands, okay, convert it to DNA. You then amplify the DNA by PCR. And then uh, once you've amplified it, uh, you, you essentially let the uh, DNA interact with something else, which gives you, let's say, a green color uh, when you have a positive identification of a particular subsequence of uh, nucleic acids uh, in, the, in, the, in the DNA. Okay, so that's, that's how, this, how the, the test works. Uh, it sounds complicated. Uh, in, in some ways it is, uh, it does take typically uh, a, a, an hour or two. Uh, and of course, Sarah, if you see this, it's, there, are, there are many potential sources of error, but there's been you know, 20, 30 years of, of uh, very, very intense work to, to optimize this uh, uh, process. So it's, it's something where quite frankly, there's not much uh, that we can, uh, uh, contribute as physicists than any more here, but it's still interesting to learn about it and to know about it. Okay, so how does PCR work? Just, just uh, this, this is how does chemical amplification work? Again, I'm sorry for the German slide, but it should be clear. You start off with DNA, which as I said, was this double helix. Uh, I straightened it out for the people who made the slide, straightened it out here. Uh, double helix consisting of your complementary uh, base pairs going across uh, the, between the two strands of the helix. Uh, what you do then is you denature it, so you heat it up, okay? And then uh, you, take the, you take it apart in okay, this way. So now you have the exposed, uh, uh, exposed bases. They're no longer base pairs. And then you bring in uh, something, uh, uh, so these strands are all floating independently. You bring in something called a primer. Primer is just essentially a micro sequence of a single, uh, basically a micro fragment of a of an RNA of, of a of a single strand, and of course that will then dock. Those micro fragments will then dock at various places uh, uh, where they find complementary sequences. They, here I just showed a primer with just three happens to be uh, three nucleic acids, and then uh, and then what happens is you 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 add actually you you keep putting in these. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this you hybridize at a lowish temperature. Then you go to an intermediate temperature. And then uh, you throw in actually some uh, free nucleotides as well. And you throw in something called this TAC uh, polymerase. And, and what happens now is you start growing essentially the complementary strand again. You start regrowing it. And finally, you cool back down again. And then you, 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 you now suddenly have essentially new, two new DNA strands, double strands now, double helices, which are exact copies of what you started out with. So this is chemical amplification and it really relies on the simplicity of the genetic code, just four nucleic acids and uh, this marvelous uh, double helix. And of course, this is why essentially the discovery of the structure of DNA made uh, believe it or not, by, by, by one of them was, was actually, I think both of them were physicists to start with, is really, uh, really uh, the key to, to all, of, all of biology. Okay. So that's how you detect the DNA. This is, in fact, what's going on in these famous PCR tests that everybody uh, uh, is, is talking about and where, you know, in some countries like the U.S., people don't have enough access. Okay, so DNA is actually quite simple. And, and uh, its simplicity allows us to detect it easily. Now, proteins uh, seem simple too at first. Uh, proteins are chains not of nucleic acids, but amino acids. And amino acids basically are these, uh, uh, are just the basic schematic is shown here. It's uh, an amine group. Basically, amine refers to this uh, nitrogen with a bunch of hydrogens attached. And then there's this, uh, this backbone, this uh, two carbon backbone, uh, one is terminated by carboxyl group. And then there's, there's this uh, middle section here uh, where uh, 
uh, which is simple on this side, just with the hydrogen, but then there's a so-called R group, and the R group can be all kinds of other stuff, organic stuff, could even be, uh, you know, ring molecules, harmonic molecules, anything you like. Uh, and so, uh, not surprisingly, actually, the amino acids, and I don't want to go through this with you, there are many, many more of them, and they're much more complicated than nucleic acids. And, of course, this gives rise to the rich uh, structures that proteins can, can assume, uh, the, the uh, tremendous uh, polymorphism uh, that, of course, is, is at the root of life, uh, but also is at the root of a lot of, of illness. And um, for protein detection, there's nothing, absolutely nothing like PCR. And so actually when you're detecting proteins, you're, you're the limits of, of concentration. I'll show you some numbers in a few minutes uh, are that you can detect uh, in a biological solution, uh, in, in, in solution without doing uh, sort of very uh, more clever laboratory-based tests is, is, is a lot, is a lot, uh, is a lot higher. So you, 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 you cannot detect proteins at the level at which you can actually count uh, viruses using, uh, using PCR. Okay, so at the end of the day, all of the tests so that we have, whether for proteins, uh, proteins of course you test for essentially by having them interact with some other protein and changing optical emission. The DNA of course you, you uh, you, you, you also see in the fluorescence assay at the end of the day, I showed you how you reproduce the DNA. Uh, I didn't show you, I detected it at the end, but at the end, of course, you denature the DNA and it attaches to something which fluoresces, let's say, if you have a matching set of base pairs and doesn't fluoresce, uh, if you don't have it, there's always a fluorescence assay at the end. And the fluorescence typically is enhanced or quenched after chemical binding event between the target molecule and the dye carrier, okay? So target molecule for PCR is, uh, is, is essentially uh, DNA. Uh, part target molecule uh, for a protein test is of course a protein itself. And then, and then uh, in e either of these cases, they glom onto, they grab onto something else uh, and then uh, it changes the optical emission. So that's all that you do. And I'm sure you're familiar with this from, from anybody who's been to the doctor's office you typically, uh, typically he's looking uh, you know, for some, uh, you, 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 you urinate, let's say on some filter paper, and then it changes color. And uh, if it, uh, if it uh, changes color in the right way or, or doesn't change color, then you're healthy. If it does change your clothes from uh, pink to red, then you're sick. Okay, that, that's always a, an optical, it's always an op almost always an optical outcome of a biomedical uh, uh, test, okay, whether it's a research lab or in a clinic. Okay, uh, interestingly enough, uh, because uh, I, I did want to get to quantum mechanics here later, uh, the, uh, one of the leading uh, manufacturers, in fact, of, of uh, biological thermometers ha already has a qubit on the market. Uh, here you see a, a, a typical thermometer uh, from, from uh, uh, Thermo Fisher. So that's their, their small, uh, very nice, like nicely packaged uh, devices. Okay, so you just you just put uh, your uh, uh, bio you you let's say put your uh, biological uh, 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 solution into this thing. Uh, you illuminate it somehow, and then the perimeter uh, tells you what the emission is, and tells you whether you're sick or not, or whether uh, in the research lab your your drug interacts, let's say, with, with the, your biomolecule. Okay. Let me repeat now, for the bio, when the biomolecule is a protein, chemical amplification is not possible. You generally rely on interaction with another molecule, for instance, a small molecule or antibody, where then you change the uh, fluorescence. Uh, let me just show you how the sort of classic uh, protein assay works. Uh, I'm just showing you something from, from our, our own work, but this is very generic. Uh, this, this happens to be uh, CEA is a, is a carcinogenic, uh, carcinoembryonic antigen, which is a marker for prostate cancer. Uh, it's this uh, uh, big, uh, uh, big uh, uh, stringy molecule. And, and then what you have at the, at the left 
is, is, a, is an antibody which you've actually engineered to look for antigens in this case. And that antibody you've modified uh, with a marker, which is a small molecule. And see again, this R is showing, and R is showing up again. That particular small molecule, uh, let's say, uh, glows when you, when you shine light on it. And, and it will glow differently uh, when uh, this uh, uh, antibody here docks with the, uh, with the stringy, with the stringy, uh, the stringy antigen. Okay, and then that tells you whether you're sick or not. Okay, so it modulates the fluorescence. So that's classic uh, solution phase uh, assay in, in biomedicine. Okay, so how do these 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 uh, normal things really really look like? How do you how do you do biological assays, basically fluorescence assays? Now, whether in fact the fluorescence is being detected at the end of PCR, and you're looking for nucleic acids or is just being used to fish for a particular protein. And in fact, these are quite, uh, uh, it's quite, a, quite a, uh, an infrastructure which, is, which you can find at these testing centers. Uh, so typically uh, what you have is, is, is you, uh, you need your proteins or your DNA and you have your reagents and that gives you your assay, as I just described. And the standard methods is, is, is that you typically try to do many assays, in fact, at once because the machines are expensive. And, and so you have these so-called assay, uh, assay plates, array plates, and then uh, each of these uh, you then fill. In fact, what I'm showing you here is a robot. Uh, I'm just showing you the outside of a big uh, sort of industrial scale robot, which is, which is filling essentially each of the wells in this assay plate with let's say somebody else's uh, somebody else's blood uh, and then it's then mixing every person's blood let's say with the same with the same reagents and uh, once it's pre once you the robot has prepared essentially a few hundred specimens you then take this assay plate and and you put it into a very fancy uh, so-called plate reader which essentially reads in a position sensitive way, uh, what the uh, fluorescent emission is from each, uh, from each well. And then you get a few hundred tests, uh, let's say for some particular antibody or a few hundred tests for some particular uh, DNA fragment, which is a signature of the virus. Okay, so that's essentially the standard method. Uh, huge experimental costs. In fact, I showed you uh, sort of a, 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 an older how things were done a, a decade ago uh, because it's easier to explain the process because there's robotics, uh, there's optics, there's chemistry. But uh, basically, uh, uh, these things that you find in the big testing center look a bit like uh, mainframe computers. Uh, this is a whole series that uh, Roche makes essentially for uh, large scale uh, biomedical testing. And what goes on in these machines is exactly what I described to you before. There's a there's a bunch of robots. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, ovens. Uh, remember that PCR requires uh, temperature uh, changes. It requires annealing and cooling cycles. Uh, proteins also uh, sometimes require uh, heating and cooling uh, to allow interactions with small molecules which carry fluorescent labels. And there's some optics, and this is all submerged in these large, uh, this large uh, apparatus. And of course, uh, although this is not a, uh, this is talk about physics and biophysics, not economics. You can imagine, of course, that whoever is selling these has an increasing stock price right now. So Roche has been doing very well out of the pandemic because they sell such machines and they sell the chemistry. Okay, so getting back to the detail now, I'm just going to show you right now how uh, we can look optically at a particular protein and we can look optically at how a particular protein interacts uh, with a small molecule. And the, the, what I've shown is actually the, the so-called rapamycin is a small molecule drug, uh, which is shown here. It's an immunosuppressant. It used, it's actually used for the treatment of prostate cancer. It's actually also come up recently in discussions of potential treatments for COVID-19, but I won't discuss that. Uh, and then uh, this, 
rapamycin actually molecule is, is the, the target by molecule is this FKBP complex, which is implicated in this case in prostate cancer. So this is a protein. I'm not drawing the individual uh, amino acids, uh, acids that, uh, that comprise it. I'm just showing you the basic structure in the way that molecular biologists like to summarize the basic structures of proteins. Okay, so how do we detect this protein? Uh, how do we measure it? So I'm, we're doing a laboratory-based thing. Uh, we don't need this large machine because we're actually trying to do some science. So, uh, but what we do here is essentially is very, very much the same thing as the big machine does is we, oops, we have a laser. And in our case, uh, we wanna work with small volumes. And that's of course a great interest also in the clinic because you don't wanna take huge amounts of blood from people. So we work with small volumes, which we put uh, into capillary. And so then this, uh, the laser then interacts with these uh, molecules. You see the biological molecules, which I'm pointing at. And here's all of the green light, uh, basically uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the light, uh, the blue light, sorry, is coming in from the laser. This is blue here. And then what the, what the molecule does if the rest is in the green. And of course that green here, so when the laser comes in here, there's the blue light. Uh, here's the green emission, we count the green light uh, with the, for the multiplier tube. And uh, what we do is actually send uh, little packages through this capillary of air and then various, uh, so we have essentially bubbles of the biological fluid which alternate between solvents for cleaning the capillary and air for calibration. And so we're just looking here at the fluorescence as a function of time as we put uh, here we put the buffer solution, a bubble, let's say a buffer solution and a bubble of air, then the sample, then air, then some cleaning solvent, some air, some more cleaning stuff, more air, buffer, and then we go through a cycle basically, which then allows us then to put the next bubble through. So this is what we actually measure. So we see fluorescence. And so this, these molecules fluoresce, we can monitor that fluorescence. And uh, this just shows uh, essentially what we've got. We've got uh, just, Conceptually, oops, this keeps uh, going through. We have this excitation source, it's a blue laser, uh, and, uh, and then it interacts with the proteins here in the solution. And so we're actually measuring a very, very small volume here, one and a half nanoliters of uh, volume, seeing that the protein actually does fluoresce much more than any of the background does. And uh, this just shows you essentially the number of proteins that we're, that we're watching with this micro uh, capillary. Actually, we're seeing just as a very primitive setup, sort of benchtop setup, we're seeing 10 to the eighth proteins. Okay. Uh, for the commercial uh, devices, actually, these microplates, uh, there's actually, uh, you need five orders of magnitude more uh, proteins because a micro well, even though they're called micro wells, and in some sense they are uh, small, you know, they measure, you know, something like uh, 260 microliters. Uh, we actually measure nanoliters and can easily detect them using this experimental setup. Okay, so now let's do some science here. So we're trying to see how this molecule interacts uh, uh, with, with a, this, this potential drug, this rapamycin. What can we learn from looking at the fluorescence? Well, again, uh, what we're learning here from the fluorescence uh, is, is, is something about the uh, rigidity or denaturation of the protein. So the protein that we're talking about, this FKBP complex, which is implicated in prostate cancer, which I'm showing you here uh, up left, when you heat it up, for example, or you add some uh, suitable solvent, uh, it actually unfolds also. But it unfolds, of course, uh, it becomes sort of a, a stringy mess from being this structured uh, protein. Uh, it's an interesting fact then, uh, then to, 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 to notice that, in fact, to ask the question of what happens to the binding, uh, what happens to this folding process when we add this uh, potential drug molecule, the, the, the rapamycin. Okay. And so what the purpose of this next slide is, is to show you that that yes, we have sensitivity to the functionality of the biological molecule using, using fluorescence, conventional fluorescence, 
And we have actually sensitivity also to its interaction with, in this case, a candidate drug molecule. And so this shows here essentially how we can essentially use uh, fluorescence first to detect the protein in the first place, and second of all, to detect how it interacts with a particular molecule. And of course, if it interacts with only one particular molecule and not other molecules, we have a unique way of identifying the protein as well. So if I have other proteins around which don't interact, let's say with rapamycin, of course the fluorescence won't change with the introduction of the rapamycin. Okay, so let me just take this through. So the, uh, this horizontal axis is a solvent, which is just called a denaturant. It's, it's, it's a particular solvent. I don't want to talk about it here. It's a bit like raising the temperature. It essentially makes, it increases the general entropy wants essentially the protein to unfold. And so I, as I add this, this solvent, it's very interesting, is that uh, the uh, fluorescent yield, which is measured on the vertical axis, increases. And what's uh, very in, especially interesting here is that if that the folded protein, and this is now we're getting into physics, the folded protein actually does not fluoresce. Whereas the unfolded protein, which is where the denaturant has been added, does fluoresce. And so if you think about that, now we're getting to interface physics, in fact, is, is of course the, this molecule fluoresces because there are aromatic bits attached to it which fluoresce. So the, the things, there's something in that molecule, which is typically, uh, which is called tryptophan, uh, which if you illuminate it with a blue, it fluoresces in the green. And when the protein is unpacked, those fluorescent sites are free and they're not bothered by other nearby amino acids from the same protein. And these other, so there's essentially a suppression when the protein is unfolded, there's a suppression of the non-radiative decays which result from absorption of a blue photon. Okay, so, so this is the case where the unfolded protein as a signature, which is fluorescence. Okay, if you fold the protein, the fluorescence is quenched, of course, because once the thing is quenched, it's a bit like a solid, and there are many, many more roots. There are all kinds of phonons and charge transfers and other things which do not radiate, which take up, which can essentially consume the energy that's contributed by the blue photon. Okay, very important. We're gonna see this again later in the talk, this, this physics. And then if I add the, uh, uh, now what's interesting about this is now if I add this rapamycin, this threshold for fluorescence uh, as measured by the concentration of this denaturant increases by more than, by about a factor, by actually a factor of four. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us that the molecule, the biomolecule, this big protein is essentially somehow stuck together or likes to stick together more when we have the target biomolecule, this rapamycin there, than the rapamycin is, is not present. Okay, so the rapamycin in some ways acts in the same way as a cast does or a splint does for a broken arm. So you know that when you break your arm, of course, you have to, you have to fix, the, you have to fix the, the bones and, and then typically you, you, you have to somehow have, have something that attaches the two broken bits to each other. That's of course known as a splint. Uh, and it essentially prevents you from breaking your arm again. So the rapamycin, its clinical efficacy actually is in not allowing, not allowing the FKBP to unfold and cause the damage it does uh, when it produces the cancer. Okay, so this is a, a sort of how a fluorescent assay works. Actually, you can work out from various uh, quantities here what the free energy is of binding. Okay, so this is all very nice, uh, but uh, this is fluorescence. Uh, and uh, I showed you a case where you, you really learn something from it. And it demonstrates essentially how, how you learn things in some of the basic physics. So there's, but there are problems. There, there's broad emission. Uh, uh, there's high background. Uh, there's a uh, low sensitivity uh, and also there, there's a linear response. So uh, it's very difficult from something which has a linear response 
really to get a yes, no answer. As you know, uh, digital computers, of course, all work on the principle of, of having nonlinear elements such as transistors, uh, where, where you really can say a switch is either on or off, there's a zero or a one. And all of this is really uh, not possible. There's no concept of an amplifier here, either on the chemical side or on the optical side. And uh, in fact, you can see here that the sensitivities, uh, this is again for our qubit, uh, uh, the sensitivities is sometimes important, uh, or not sometimes, it's always important in physics or biophysics to keep track of, uh, keep track of the numbers. You can see here that you have very, very high sensitivities for uh, RNA and DNA. If you look at sort of the, the figures of merit, sort of nanograms per, per microliter, unfortunately, these people change uh, when they deal with uh, genetic material, they're dealing uh, per microliter. When they're dealing with proteins, they're dealing with milliliters, which already shows you the problem. But of course, you can multiply by 10 to the third and still see that the protein assays are much, much less sensitive than the uh, uh, than, than the uh, uh, than the, the genetic assays because the genetic assays re rely on nucleic acids okay and the protein assay here okay uh, this this of course relies uh, uh, relies on, uh, on, uh, on amino acids and looking at particular sequences of amino acids which interact with other molecules okay. So just to give you some numbers here, again, which you can abstract from this table and also abstract from the, from the, from the literature, uh, typically uh, you can detect uh, essentially uh, 87.5 picomoles per, per milliliter. That's sort of 10 to the 13 molecules per milliliter uh, and where the typical separation between molecules is something like 270 nanometers. Okay, that's actually quite uh, a lot of molecules. Okay, so uh, what's the solution now? How do we fix the problem of detecting proteins? How do we compete with the sensitivity we have to DNA? So the solution actually is very simple. And the solution is natural to physicists, not so natural to biologists. So the idea is simple, we amplify the light. And, and what I'm gonna show you now is, is that you, uh, that we've actually been able to develop a flexible platform for light amplification. And this platform basically is, if you wish, uh, uh, provides an interface with which uh, you can essentially, uh, with, with an interface to which you combine proteins and the optical emission properties of this interface will depend on whether the protein is binding or not. In the same way that the optical emission of a protein itself will depend on whether the protein is folded or not, which is something I just showed you a minute ago for this FKBP. And uh, what we're taking advantage of here is, is uh, you know, 50 or 60 year old idea of lasing, plus uh, sort of newer ideas, namely of, of synthetic bio, uh, biology, essentially to build this uh, flexible uh, protein. And of course, uh, uh, we implement the uh, experiment uh, in, in, a, in a very, very simple way. It's essentially the same experiment I showed you a minute ago, where we just add mirrors to create a lasing cavity uh, uh, rather than just uh, looking at the emission uh, into free space. So, uh, Jean-Marc, uh, how much time have I got left? Uh, Gabriel, okay, actually I was wrong because you give a lecture, so you have 30 more minutes. Okay, good. Uh, perhaps uh, I would uh, like to, because we're now going to uh, move to the, to the lasing, I just want if, to know if there are any questions, I've covered quite a lot of material, are there any questions so far about either the epidemiology, R factors, or about just simple uh, sort of biophysical detection using fluorescence. Are there any questions right now? I guess if there aren't, uh, I mean, we can, you can save them for later, but I, I, if, if it wasn't clear what I, uh, if there are any need for clarification, because now we're gonna make things more complicated because we're gonna add some nonlinear optics. Maybe Gabriel, just one question about what you just talked about, this uh, RAPA mistin. 
yeah. which is uh, somehow blocking the uh, unfolding of, right. of this molecule. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe you said it, but is it, is it mechanical when you see the binding of this rapamycin or is it something more sophisticated? Well, it's, it's, why it's, you it's, cannot unfold. it's just charges. The binding is, is essentially just, just uh, mm -hmm. electric uh, polarization, uh, electric dipole moments. So I mean, everything binds to everything else because of because of uh, uh, you know essentially electromic you know in, in this case just just electrical uh, interactions. It's Coulomb interactions with screening. Yeah, yeah sure, but but so it, it, it just these interactions which are some are mechanically blocking the molecules and not allowing. Uh, right. the it, and it essentially, yeah. So what you can see is it's exactly like the broken arm. You know, so you know this is the broken arm here. Mm -hmm. And then you just, this molecule goes into this pocket here in the middle. And then essentially it's like patches the broken arm together. And of course it, it basically, it's, it's again, all electrostatic interactions, uh, you know, van der Waals and everything else, uh, which, which then, which then uh, prevents the molecule from, uh, from exploring the phase space that it has in the unfolded state. Okay, thank you. But it's a very, very, it's an extremely pretty demonstration of binding, and it's uh, and we could do it with temperature, of course, as well as with uh, uh, with chemical denaturant. It was easier with that particular apparatus that we had in the initial phase uh, to to do it with uh, uh, to do to do the unbinding with uh, uh, with chemical denaturation because of this bubble uh, packages that we could we could make going into that apparatus. But uh, we've also done this as a function of temperature, these kinds of experiments. Okay, so the optics is simple. We're just gonna add mirrors to this. Uh, now the platform, so what are we got? What's the interface here? Uh, what we're gonna do here is, is actually create a, a virus or use a virus which is fully programmable. And this is the so-called M13 filamentous bacteriophage, okay? It's something that we can assemble ourselves. We, we can essentially program the genetic code for this virus uh, in such a way that, of course, we program the nucleic acid in the middle of it. This now is not a sphere. This is a, essentially a, a long uh, cylindrical object. And we can program the coproteins. And in particular, of course, we can program the coproteins essentially to be, uh, to be proteins that, let's say, interact with a virus, another virus, a natural virus, or a, a bad virus like coronavirus. Or it can be programmed, the coproteins can be uh, programmed to interact with a particular antibody or a particular antigen that you would find in the biological, uh, biological uh, solution. And so, uh, and so this is essentially, the, these, this is, these are the, the coproteins. Um, and then there's, there's some uh, uh, things here at the end, but I'm not gonna, those are not really uh, that relevant uh, to talk about now. The point is you have complete control. You can genetically engineer this particular quantum object and just make huge quantities of it uh, with a, an amazing degree of perfection. Okay, so this thing is basically that we use is, is, is macroscopic uh, or al almost macroscopic in one dimension. It's one micron long, but it's actually six and a half nanometers in diameter, all self-assembled. And so here are my coproteins. Uh, here's the antibody that uh, uh, we've chosen. We've basically chosen a particular uh, monoclonal antibody that this uh, interacts with uh, so that we can uh, see whether this works as an immunoassay. The other important thing that we've uh, actually programmed it to do is essentially to host chromophores, okay, particular chromophores. These again are, are things that uh, convert uh, uh, a short wavelength of light into a high wave, uh, long, uh, uh, longer wavelength of light by absorption. Uh, we've actually engineered docking sites for fluorescein, which is this uh, molecule here. So again, you absorb in the blue, you emit in the green. And these, these objects here are well-defined locations on, on the virus. 
And of course, then you can imagine that if this big virus interacts, let's say, with other viruses or with this molecule, that you can modulate the fluorescence, uh, fluorescence emission. So here you have a platform for bio uh, detection, but the physics is exactly the same as when we're dealing essentially with some kind of a, a quantum dot. As you know, depending on where the quantum dot is located, its optical properties can be interesting or, or totally, totally boring, and they can be modulated essentially by, let's say, how close the dots are to each other or how close the dots are to, to, to the surface, let's say, of a, of a, of a three, five semiconductor sample. Okay, so that's the physics. Now, these things have, you know, completely, uh, you know, garden variety uh, absorption, absorption spectra. Uh, and and uh, in fact, uh, you can take this dye molecule, this green molecule, uh, the green molecule itself, you can look at in solution and you can compare it with, with what occurs when you immobilize it on the surface of this uh, virus. And actually it doesn't change very much. It's just a continuum. So, so what's what's interesting here is you know that this molecule has really gone on in sort of this very simple optical characterization. Nothing much has changed. Uh, likewise, uh, you know for the for the for the uh, fluorescence uh, emission. So here we're actually exciting at 493 nanometers, uh, and we're looking here more towards the red. Uh, and, and you're seeing here, uh, uh, what you have is, is what we always do. Now we have to think quantitatively again. We try to match solutions. What does that mean? I try to compare the unbound molecule, the unbound molecule, which of course would be less susceptible to quenching, non-radiative decays in solution. We match the number of those molecules per milliliter to the number of such molecules when we have them immobilized, the fluorescein immobilized on these long cigar-like platforms, which are the M13 virus, the same. Okay, so in linear optics, nothing much has changed. Okay, so all I've done, say so what? So I've immobilized these things. Uh, so now we uh, actually do the classic thing. We, we, I said we'd put the, these molecules into uh, solution, and then we we go ahead and we we they'd pump on them, and and uh, we put we put them between two mirrors. We put them in a in a resonating cavity, and then uh, sure enough, actually, this stuff, this biological stuff, which we created basically by genetic programming, actually actually lasers, and and you can see here the lasing uh, rather directly. Uh, this shows uh, with how, with a small increase, this is now simply the emission output of these of this uh, of this uh, uh, of this uh, viral laser, as a function of the the emission uh, of, uh, as a function of wavelength. This year, the output is now measured on a logarithmic scale, and uh, I'm essentially putting I'm pumping this with the, with a nanosecond laser itself. So the the, the pump laser is is uh, is, is essentially, uh, uh, is, is, is just a, a standard uh, blue laser. And I'm getting here, uh, I'm having an input of five and a half times 10 to 14 photons per pulse. And I get this light blue curve. If I increase it a little bit less than twice, I get orders of magnitude increase in emission. And the emission is, is basically, the emission line is, is roughly uh, matched in width to the uh, finesse of the cavity. Uh, now, what's interesting is, is now I'm starting to do some physics. So I'm comparing in this inset, the unbound fluorescein with the fluorescein bound to the phage. Okay, so you're seeing here my emission, in this case, uh, as I said, it's in the red. Uh, the unbound fluorescein has a shorter wavelength emission and a single peak, again, notice that it's a logarithmic scale, Whereas uh, when, it's, when this material is bound to the phage, when the same molecule is bound to the phage, you actually get a red shift and you get actually two peaks. You get this shoulder, okay? So now you're beginning to see actually that when I start doing nonlinear optics, I'm seeing that actually 
there's a binding event. This is the first binding event that we're going to talk about. This is the small molecule binding to the big virus. Okay, so there's there's a change. I cannot see this kind of, I cannot do this kind of detection. I cannot detect any change really, meaningful change uh, between the linear optical response of the of the uh, fluorescein when it's in solution and when it's immobilized on the on the phage. But in the nonlinear optics, when I start pumping, I start learning some new science. Now this shows a LASIK threshold. So as a function of of the uh, uh, as a function of the pump, and um, this it also shows you. So this is the pump uh, intensity. It's how many photons I have per pulse per pump pulse. And I'm comparing here uh, a bunch of different uh, concentrations, basically of the phage uh, of, of the phage uh, of the virus in solution, and I'm comparing that with a matched uh, uh, amount, basically matched the blue curve here of uh, free fluorescein. So you can see that actually the free fluorescein lasers before. The, uh, uh, before the uh, uh, virus starts lasing. But, uh, but you can see that the virus does lase, you undergo many orders of magnitude increase uh, in, the, uh, in the signal uh, uh, at these very, very uh, relatively modest uh, uh, pumps. Okay, so we've succeeded actually getting the virus to lase. And, I can, and the lasing threshold is very, very sensitive to the number of viruses that I have. So as I decrease the density, say from 377 picomoles per milliliter, 65 picomoles per milliliter, uh, I, I essentially can no longer laze. Uh, I see a transition essentially from lasing to non-lasing. Now, why is this interesting? So let me replot the data. Now I'm gonna plot, uh, I'm gonna show the data for fixed pump as a function of viral load. And of course, there's, the, there's a lasing transition, the same lasing transition because I'm just cutting through the same uh, two-dimensional space of, you know, which is spanned by the viral load and the pump. And what I'm seeing again, the uh, output is on a logarithmic scale. As I increase, let's say the viral load here uh, for this particular power, okay, this is the, the blue power, uh, I'm actually uh, able to, to detect uh, essentially whether or not I have the, whether, whether I have uh, something like uh, 100, oops, 130, something like picomoles per milliliter, that represents the onset of lasing. Okay, so if I, what this means is very significant for a clinician. A clinician will tell you that you're sick if you have some kind of a molecule in your blood, which is in excess of some normal concentration so let's say he says whatever disease you have, let's say it's prostate cancer uh, or, or what have you then, or, or if you have, let's say COVID-19, uh, you've got to have uh, so many picomoles per milliliter of the virus. Uh, you're sick if it's below, you're sick if the viral concentration is above that, you're not sick if it's below. Uh, with a fluorescence type assay, you'll be in a linear regime of the response and, and you really can't tell much of a difference between an output on this scale of, of, of 10 and 20. On the other hand, he can, tell, there's, he can easily tell the difference between lazing and not lazing between this output and that output. So what you have is, is ability now to do threshold detection of biomolecules in a particular uh, virus. So with this lazing. So we've gotten, we built a biological laser, uh, basically a viral laser, and uh, we already can measure at least uh, in a proof of concept way in our labs with the synthetic virus of viral load. So where do the lines through the data come from? Well, of course, uh, I can just show you uh, diagrams from classic textbook on, on lasing. So what we've got here is, is in this case, we're, we're coming in, let's say, uh, with, with blue light and coming out with green or coming in with green and going out with blue, it doesn't matter which. Uh, but uh, what you have is, is you have some basic uh, uh, ground state population, and then you have an excited state manifold uh, with a rapid non-radiative decay, let's say to some shelving state uh, upper level. And then uh, you, uh, things uh, take some time to decay here, uh, and you then see uh, essentially a decay to this at the upper part of the ground state manifold. 
And, and this uh, green light is essentially what you'd like to, uh, what you'd like to produce in large quantities. And of course, the way you, you, you make this happen is you pump this so hard, essentially that you get a population inversion uh, where uh, relative to thermal equilibrium, where you have more uh, uh, dyes, viruses in the upper state than in the ground state. And then yeah. you populate, if it's overpopulated inversion, you then, uh, you, you then essentially can have uh, stimulated emission. Gabriel? Yes. Gabriel? Yes. Yes, yes there, there was a question regarding uh, one slide just before. Ingrid, maybe you can ask your question. Yeah, this one. Hello? Or maybe I can ask a question. The question from Ingrid is, is what are the different curves? Are there different okay. photon intensities? Yes, there are different photon intensities. So this one was different uh, concentrations of the virus in solution. And so these are just simply the same data replotted as a function of concentration. Okay, thank I, you. I collect data as a function of, of pump, as a collection, and as a function of the, uh, uh, of the concentration. And then I'm just showing you several fixed, I'm showing you at fixed pumps uh, what happens as a function of the concentration. Okay, thank you. So this is basically thinking of the doctor in his office who has a fixed laser, he's not gonna be tuning the laser. He's not gonna be tuning the laser output, uh, or at least in a very simple uh, version of the story, he wouldn't, he, but what he'll have is different samples with different viral loads, and some will laser and some won't. Okay, so this is the, the famous uh, laser equation, which is of course, uh, which now allows you to have gain. Uh, because it's nonlinear. And so what you look at here is, of course, the energy in the resonator mode. The resonator mode is, of course, what you're detecting with your uh, photomultiplier tube or, or, or diode uh, uh, outside the mirrors, which are not, which are not completely 100% reflective. And essentially, the, the number of photons or the energy in the resonator mode, the time derivative of that, is of course related to the number of dyes in the uh, in the upper state, multiplied of course by uh, uh, by the uh, this is the stimulated emission process, uh, which is regulated by the by what you have in the upper state. Uh, in other words, what you have in the resonated mode, and then of course uh, there'll just be the simple decays, which are non-stimulated, uh, and then of course you'll have uh, you'll have the the loss, uh, the loss from the resonator. So these are the fundamental equations. Of course, you can write down, of course, a similar equation for the number of dyes here, D2. Uh, and, and then you can proceed, of course, to solve these equations in the same way that you solve essentially uh, the mean field equations as described by the Landau-Ginsberg theory. You essentially get an equilibrium occup photon occupancy or energy in the resonator mode. So you should set these derivatives to zero and then solve these nonlinear equations, just nonlinear system of equations, non-differential equations, essentially to get what you have in the upper mode, or what you have in the in the uh, what the energy that the resonator contains. And uh, I'm not going to work through the algebra uh, on this. We can just simply do that algebra yourself as a as a as a homework problem. But you'll notice that there's some interesting features of that, which are very, which are exactly the same as you'll find, uh, you know, when you solve the Landau-Ginsberg equations, is there's a, there's a, 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 a crucial parameter here, uh, dk rad divided by kl minus one, okay, uh, which of course, uh, which has the possibility uh, to, to, cross, uh, to cross zero. And there's a k2, and so this combination here of factors here can cross zero. Uh, and, uh, in, and, and so what you, what you do is of course, n is of course only allowed to be, and is only allowed to be positive. So there's a critical point here that occurs essentially when this number here crosses, uh, crosses zero. And so, which is very, very similar. In fact, this kind of expression, of course, pops up uh, when you just deal with, uh, with normal 
uh, Curie Weiss uh, ferromagnet as well. And in fact, uh, what you can see from inspecting these equations is that when this parameter dK rad divided by KL is less than one, there's actually no lasing. Whereas when dK rad divided by KL is larger than one, uh, there, there, is, uh, there is lasing. Okay, so what the crucial thing here is, is that D is the number of molecules that you have and KL is, is uh, essentially the loss from the cavity and K rad is essentially the radiative decay from the molecule. Okay, these things relate directly to the things that I was talking about before. Uh, D of course is a measure of the number of biological molecules or relevant biomolecules in the solution. K rad is something to do with the, uh, with the, with the competition between radiative and non-radiative decay processes. So these two things, the D and the K rad, are the things that change depending on the biology. KL is of course uh, what, you, what the optical engineer gives you that has to do with the cavity, optical cavity. And so this, uh, what's here is what controls your ability to do biology. And now uh, you can compute using the mean field theory, of course, the threshold for lasing. The threshold for lasing looks just like the Curie-Weiss formula I mentioned before. It involves essentially this, uh, this uh, K2, which is a rate of decay, radiative decay from the upper state of the dye, this KL, and K rad. And you can see that uh, you get a divergence of this quantity. The threshold goes to infinity, which means it stops lasing at that point when this term and this term are precisely balanced. And uh, we can plot the Curie Weiss law essentially now as a function of viral load. And actually, the data this is a log, this is a log log plot actually follows rather well. This is the, these are the viral lasers here. Uh, where we vary the viral load. And this is the threshold point, basically, in the number of uh, photons per pulse for uh, lasing. And so uh, this is all extremely nice and um, uh, very simple. Okay, so we have a code for counting viruses. We have some kind of a Curie Weiss description of that. Uh, what about now, uh, this, this is nice. What about detecting small numbers of protein, smaller than we could with this famous qubit uh, that in vitrogen will sell you. So uh, what we decided to do here uh, is, is we, we, we essentially wanted our protein now, a target protein, which is this monoclonal antibody, we wanted uh, that to interact with this, uh, with this M13 uh, uh, phage. So to get the sensitivity up, we decided to decrease the density of probes, the density of viruses essentially to enhance the probability that any particular virus will encounter the target protein. The second thing that we did was we decided we wanted to have, uh, uh, while we wanted to essentially make it more likely that any given probe molecule will actually see the protein, the target protein, uh, we wanted to increase the luminosity of, it, of the individual uh, uh, viruses. So we just increased the density of the uh, uh, of the thoracene on each M13 virus. Okay, so we have fewer of them, but they're brighter. Okay, uh, and as I say, important to keep in mind the reason we wanted fewer of them is to increase the likelihood that they would encounter the target molecule and therefore spoil the lasing. Of course, I have lots and lots of uh, M13 viruses in solution and very, very few target molecules. Of course, there's a population imbalance there and it'll be difficult to, to, to get the sensitivity up. But then I decided, we decided to increase the, the, uh, the, the light that can be emitted by a single uh, virus by increasing number of chromophores. And then we, and, and we fiddled around with the resonator. Uh, okay, so here are the results for this uh, revised uh, virus. So, so what I'm showing you here, uh, and I just want you to focus uh, uh, focus on the on the bottom slide because I don't think I have very much more time. Is again with this new modified uh, uh, virus, I I get uh, again very very be beautiful uh, uh, lasing. Uh, 
uh, this is above threshold, the blue curve, and then the gray curve is a little, just a little bit below threshold. And, uh, but there's some other aspects of this which, which are different from uh, what we saw before and actually differ in significant ways, uh, particularly from uh, the mean field theory uh, that I was using uh, to describe the data. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is a comparison now again between matched volumes, matched densities of fluorescein in the solution. So the same number of fluorescein molecules essentially in the cavity, but in one case immobilized on the, on the virus, in the other case not. So one case on an interface, in the other case without the interface. So without the interface is the red curves here. This is the fluorescein. And just in this new cavity showing essentially a uh, very respectable mean field behavior. If I uh, then uh, now uh, look, at, look at the virus though, I'm no longer following mean field theory. So the blue case here, the virus no longer follows the mean field theory. In fact, the best fit is this, which doesn't make any sense. So there's something, something has changed here in the physics as I increase the density of chromophores on the surface. So this is beginning to look like many body physics. So I have a two dimensional system. In this case, it's a two dimensional system on a six and a half nanometer diameter cylinder. Uh, these, now I've increased the density of chromophores. They're starting to interact on that surface in a non-trivial way and actually change, uh, change this uh, lasing curve. And uh, it turns out actually that, that something uh, indeed has changed and uh, Again, I don't have probably enough time to talk about this, but we, we can talk about it more in the, in the question and answer session. The equations, the standard equations that you find in the textbook essentially for, for lasing, in fact, have, have a fundamental symmetry in them in that there's uh, a, uh, uh, this is the, the, the mode occupancy here, the time derivative of the mode occupancy, and this is the time derivative of the occupancy of the upper level of the, of the, for the transition. And they have a fundamental symmetry in that, if, in fact, this time derivative here contains essentially this term, uh, which in exactly, in exactly the same form. It turns out though, that if you have a nonlinear susceptibility, nonlinear susceptibility for your optical medium, this symmetry is broken in the fact there's a C here, which is no longer one. And actually, if we put this uh, nonlinear, this asymmetry coefficient in, actually we get a uh, substantially better uh, description of the data, but not perfect. So this is an interesting uh, uh, physics problem still, is, is uh, how do you describe essentially when you increase the density of phages, you get into this interacting regime uh, where, where the, uh, which actually suppresses uh, changes, does not suppress the lasing, is still getting many orders of magnitude improvement of the optical emission, but suppresses it relative to the simple mean field theory. Okay, so, uh, so that, that's some physics now getting back to medicine and uh, eventually hopefully we'll get back to testing for antibodies uh, against uh, COVID-19. I'm just going to show you essentially a test of the mix and measure assay where we add an antibody. This is a gamma globulin, not very different, in fact, from the antibodies that are uh, that are uh, that seem to be associated with COVID-19. And uh, what what I'm showing you here is uh, is what happens, of course, uh, below threshold. This is 1.6 times 10 to 15 photons per pulse. Okay, for the phage alone, this is above the threshold. And then when I add the phage, when I add the antibody, you can see there's a dramatic suppression of lasing, even though what happens uh, uh, below the threshold, there's hardly a change. So you can see here a yes, no answer. You have antibody, there's no lasing. You don't have antibody, there is lasing. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a three orders of magnitude change here. Okay, so, so we have actually a mix and measure assay. Actually, I didn't tell you, 
this is the green curve is actually with the antibody as well. So this is the lasing threshold. As I pump harder and harder, I laze when the antibody is not there, but I don't laze if the antibody is there. Now, sanity check, any experimentalist uh, knows this, is of course, uh, you wanna see if, if, if this is just something to do with the antibody changing the optical properties of the medium, nothing to do with the lasing a priori. Uh, the fluorescein is unaffected by the presence of the antibody. Okay. So I, I have a definite uh, lasing assay for antibody. Okay, so uh, now I can, uh, of course, uh, start uh, uh, seeing how low a concentration of antibody I can find. And uh, let me just go here to uh, a cut through that slide, which is less busy. So what I'm doing is, a, is an experiment that biologists would do, uh, because as, as you know, it takes a, a while for proteins to, to fuse around because they're big floppy molecules. And uh, what I'm doing, you, I'm doing here is showing essentially the output, lasing output or optical output in photons per pulse for a fixed input uh, photon uh, energy, photon numbers of photons. Uh, and uh, I'm dribbling in actually antibodies. So I've got my lasing. And then I'm putting in nine femtomol per milliliter of antibody after about 40 minutes, and then nothing much happens there. So I can't really detect that. So I have probably too many detecting particles, too many M13 uh, viruses, essentially, uh, to, to be able to, you see, in a meaningful way, interact with this low conjugate. But at 29 femtomol per milliliter, after a little while, actually, I see a very substantial decay in the, in the lasing, actually, uh, something by factor of five. 90 femtomolar, I, I then let this relax a while. And then after I add here, after three hours, I add 90 femtomol per milliliter, I get another decay. So I'm actually getting a very, very sensitive uh, assay uh, for the antibodies. What I'm showing you here is, is, is the, the same uh, data or the data taken in the same way, but for lower powers. So this is a high, relatively high power so that I can see essentially uh, lasing thresholds. That means I'm, if the lasing threshold is very high, that means I have a very low concentration, low concentration of uh, lasing elements. Uh, so I'm more sensitive with this high power, but even with a low power, I can see after 29 femtomolars, I see actually a decrease in the, in the emission. Of course, with the lowest power, I never laser at all. That's green. And that's important because this is just fluorescence. So with fluorescence, I would never see anything at all. So at the lowest power, which is below the lasing threshold, I don't see any of this. I don't see nine femtomoles, I don't see 29, I don't see 90. I just always see some fluorescence, that's it. So I have no detection with conventional fluorescence. I have real detection to very small concentrations with lasing. Okay, so let me summarize here. So viruses can lase. And I've shown you at the beginning why we want lasing viruses, because we want to detect viruses and we want to detect biomolecules using these viruses, using viruses. And particularly we want to detect proteins rather than just, just genetic material, DNA and RNA. The simplest mean field theory is actually always a good, as always actually, a good starting point, just as in any physics problem, the mean field theory of the laser. Uh, we can change the parameters of experiments because we have programmable quantum dots. These quantum dots are actually these M13 lasers, completely programmable. And so just like in an MBE chamber where we can change thickness, let's say of the, of the layers, we can change various growth conditions. Here we can dial in essentially attachment sites. We can dial in densities of, uh, of, of uh, chromophores. But once we start doing that, we, we need to generalize a theory and certain interesting nonlinear response terms enter. We actually, but still actually, in my mind, they still don't adequately describe what's going on. I've shown you uh, the importance of the research. Uh, it's not just intellectually interesting, but I, I have a sense that uh, by showing that we have optical, we can exploit optical amplification for biomedicine 
uh, we may now have something that's as powerful as chemical amplification was for, as powerful for proteins as chemical amplification was for nucleic acids. So what we have now is a new platform. We have genetically programmed quantum matter rather than just MBE or chemically tunable uh, quantum matter. So summarize, we turbocharge the qubit for lasing rather than fluorescence. Uh, some numbers uh, to start thinking. Uh, detection threshold is 29 femtomol per milliliter of antibodies compared to 100 picomol per milliliter for conventional assays. And here's some useful numbers to start thinking about the physics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for this uh, beautiful presentation and for showing us how optical techniques and lasing can help us detect viruses and, and antibodies. Really fascinating. Uh, I don't know if you have questions. You can maybe ask questions directly to Gabriel or raise your hand. I don't see everyone, so eventually raise your hand. Maybe I can start with a question, uh, Gabriel, uh, related to lasing. Uh, this, this was the first point of your summary, uh, viruses can laze, uh, which I find really kind of uh, incredible. Uh, now you, you, you show this equation, which is yeah, telling us, uh, you know, or giving us a threshold above which uh, there will be lazing, but but to get this lazing, okay, maybe it's a naive question, but don't you need a, a very special electronic structure with very long lifetime at some level, or is it obvious <laughs> that viruses can laze? Well, you do. You of course need this, and so you need all of these. You know, you have a you have to have some kind of a multi-level system. So typically, you need you ideally have a, at the very least a three-level system. And so you notice here that you have essentially a, a ground state, very important, and then some excited state, which is the third level, which then which then has a, 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 a the ability essentially to 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 decay rapidly to to a, a long lived state D two. Mm -hmm. So that's important. Of course, if everything decays uh, very quickly. Then of course it won't lay. And of course the formulas, if you look, if you inspect the formulas, you can actually see. Uh, let me. You can see that it shouldn't lay if these decays are too. If these decays are too fast. So so it's extremely important that you have a well-defined, that you have uh, at least two well-defined quantum levels. And then and then one of those, the upper one at least, has to be in a manifold, where you can pump it as much as you want. And then that essentially decays down to this, to this, to this flow. So there's got to be a gap in the system. Mm -hmm. This is, of course, remember the physics is the same. Metals don't laze. But insulators laze. Metals cannot laze. But, but me, I, I guess my question is, is uh, are we or are you lucky with this particular virus, which has this long leave D2 state? Or, or is it something that you expect to be there in, in, in most viruses? I well, there's the it's, I engineered this one to be particular a particularly good laser. Okay. Okay, because what I did, what what, what I did, what the student did, what John did, uh, uh, because he's he is actually a biology student, is this thing here mm -hmm. is it lasers by itself. Okay. So the essence, this chromophore, the essence of this laser is that I took a known dye laser, which is thoracine, which is this molecule, and, and all, of the, all that I'm doing is I'm getting it to laze, but I'm now seeing how its lasing behavior is modified by being attached to programmable sites on a surface. Okay, so the physics, the physics is really exciting here because what I have is essentially a genetically programmable system where I can change the locations and of course by that the density of known chromophores on the surface. So these 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 are essentially modules that I can just get out of as, as you wish from a chemist. Mm -hmm. Then they, they have well-defined attachment sites on this virus. So that's how I got this virus to lay. Okay. Now so this is this is 
this is synthetic biology. Mm -hmm. uh, what, of course, I showed you previous to that is that biology itself, or natural, you know, biology itself, of course, has lots of green fluorescent proteins. And so when you look at all of the amino acids in nature, naturally occurring amino acids, let me just show you what an amino acid looks like. There's this, I, I said, there's this R group here. Of course, in nature, there are amino acids called tryptophans, which actually have little bits that don't, that are not dissimilar to, to fluorescein, will also emit. And the fact that the part of the talk where I talked about the rapamycin and the, and the FKBP, is that we use the natural emission properties of the, of the protein. What we have not done yet is actually worked on pumping natural proteins. What we've done is, is so far we've been pumping uh, the, uh, our artificially, basically our genetically engineered quantum dots or quantum cigars. Thank you. Uh, other questions or comments to Gabrielle's talk? I guess uh, my question is again related to that. Maybe uh, Gabe, you can show that phage and those chromophores. Uh, it's a quite a complicated uh, system. So to try to understand what you're saying is that it, it's essentially these uh, green objects that are right. providing the two-level system for the for the laser. Is right. that correct? Right. And so this phage, you know, this this phage is what you call the virus. The phage is a virus. Yeah, the phage is the virus. And then when you have the antibody, um, you know, attached to the to the virus, how does it then suppress the lasing? Okay, it suppresses the lasing because now the medium has changed, and so I have all kinds of uh, what I've done here is I I have essentially many new non-radiative channels uh, coming in. And I'm changing, I'm modifying the linear and non-linear, especially the non-linear susceptibility of the, uh, the non-linear susceptibility of the, of the, uh, of the phage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and, and what's interesting about this is, is it turns out in the linear regime, as I showed you, nothing changes. The fluorescence doesn't change whether I've got the, the uh, the fluorescein immobilized on this surface, or whether it's uh, whether it's in free in solution. Mm -hmm. So it's it is a many body effect because a nonlinear susceptibility is of course a multi particle correlation function, and so that's that's what happens. So I have various so so uh, and so in, in exactly the same way, I showed a, a, a simpler version of the same physics initially. Uh, in this case, actually, it's the nonlinear susceptibility that's changed in, in this, in this uh, with the antibody binding. Uh, in the case of the rapamycin, actually, the linear susceptibility changes already when the protein unfolds. So what we're looking at here with the lasing is a much more subtle change in the physics uh, with its binding of the antibody then we're looking uh, at when we're, we're seeing how the rapamycin uh, fluorescence changes when it unfolds. Okay. But so we're dealing here, actually, in the case of the rapamycin, it's, 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 uh, it's not a many body effect. It's just simply the, well, it is a many body effect in, in the sense that when we pack the chromophore, which is an amino acid, which has something like this in it, naturally, when we pack the chromophore together, then there's, there's a lot more radiative decays, and we see that already in the fluorescence. Here, the binding of the antibody to the, to the, uh, to, to the phage is actually modulates the, uh, um, it does not modulate the fluorescence. It actually, the main thing it does in any meaningful way, it actually modulates the non response. Gabriel, we, we, we see with the binding of the antibodies, you, 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 you you get much less lasing, but you also showed that with unbound uh, molecules and, and the phages, you have a shift in the yes in, in the the peak at which you, you observe lasing, right. which is I guess telling you that 
you have a modification of the electronic structure due to yes. the, uh, okay, I, I, I realize in view of the complexity of these molecules, what we're possible to calculate, but uh, can no, you get to guess? It's a Kramer's chronic. I mean, you know, once of course you see, you know, everything is, you have a whole bunch of, you know, the, the, the amazing thing is, is actually not, is, is not that these things are complicated. The amazing thing is how simple the physics actually is, even though the molecules look complicated. Because, you know, you, you, you know, before you, uh, you know, in, in certain limits, in the low density limit, for instance, of thoracine, the mean field theory works. Which is amazing for something this complicated. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking. And, okay, you see a shift in. in and the shift. No, that, I'm going to get to the shift now. Okay, the shift, sorry. Of course, it's just when I show you, of course, the lasing changes, susceptibilities are changing, and therefore, of course, the real part has to change as well as the imaginary part. So there's a Kramer's Kronig. That's where I was going to. There's, of course, a, it, it has to change by Kramer's Kronig. Okay. Because because you're you're not allowed to have. The, you know, the imaginary uh, parts, uh, you know, the response function change without the real parts changing. And so, of course, they should shift. And of course, you know, they shift in the correct direction. I mean, everything, uh, of course, they soften. Things soften because, because there are additional phonons around, basically. And so the level, of course, that D1, you know, the splitting of the level is renormalized by the presence, you know, this this level here, where this the position of this level is renormalized down because there are extra extra states up here. So in other words, you dress the uh, the, the molecule is dressed by all this stuff that go that goes on around it. So this is pushed down, and then that of course should be up. Well, I haven't checked it. The, the extent to which it's pushed down is of course given by a Kramer's Kronig relationship. Uh, which uh, to do with uh, these decays. Okay, thank you. So, but as I say, the, the thing I was using your question to make the point that things are, the physics actually works. Okay. Yeah. In, a, in a remarkable, remarkably simple physics works in a remarkably complicated system. Okay. That's a very good, very good point. <laughs> and very good wall. And I'm not sure if we'll terminate here. Do you have more questions or comments for? Gabriel, it's the very last moment to ask. Doesn't seem to be the case. So Gabriel, thank you very much again for this beautiful presentation and uh, to have linked your studies to COVID-19. So I propose to stop here. Thank you very much again. And uh, okay, we stop here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Gabriel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Mark. Andrea. Bye-bye.